Well, hello from the line. Thank, thank you for joining us for this timely discussion. The pandemic should have brought the U.S. and China closer together for greater cooperation, but instead, it's accelerated tensions with bilateral relations sinking to the lowest and looking more and more irreversible. That, in turn, is changing the dynamics of the international system with Indo-Pacific economies finding themselves caught in the middle. Navigating between the U.S. and China is becoming increasingly difficult. So can middle powers like India, Indonesia, Korea, and Singapore band together, shape and influence Chinese or American behavior? Or are they destined to be pawns in a game of power? I'm really excited to introduce to you our distinguished speakers today. Ambassador Chan Heng Chi is Asia Society co-chair, Dr. Dewi Fortuna Anwar, Research Center for Politics, Indonesian Institute of Sciences. Shushanka Menon is former Foreign Secretary of India and Dr. Jun Park, East Asia Focus Initiative Fellow at the East Asian National Resource Center, Allied School of International Affairs, the George Washington University. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Now, Shiv, you're the only thorn among the roses, so this thorny question goes to you. Can middle mm -hmm. powers really refrain from taking sides in this emerging new Cold War? We've already seen the likes of India, Australia, some parts of the EU gravitating towards the US. Well, I think they can, actually because we have a very both because of the situation and because of the nature of the issues that we we face today uh the world i mean asia is not either china centric or us led right now it's between orders and looks like staying that way and the world itself is is multipolar economically but not really in military terms and politically it's thoroughly confused so if you look at what's happened in the last 15 years, middle powers are doing much more together than they've ever done before. Just the four countries that are on this panel are cooperating in defense and security, in, in various fields, which prime, maritime security primarily. And if you look at the issues that we face, these are not issues that either any single power, no matter how powerful, can solve. Issues like cyber, like terrorism, like maritime security. This needs cooperative effort. So what I see happening, and this is my mantra, actually, which I think Dewey has heard me say before, is really issue-based coalitions of the willing. And that's where middle powers really have room, because China-U.S. contention opens up space for the middle powers to actually play a role and deal with these issues, which are transnational issues and are beyond the power of any single great power, superpower, whatever to solve. That brings us to the point of creative multilateralism, as some call it. Ibu Dewi, you've said before that Indonesia and the rest of Southeast Asia have always been in a dangerous environment. Your own words there. The U.S. across the Pacific is also China, Japan, Russia. Is it different this time around with competition between the U.S. and China? Well, it's, I mean, Southeast Asia has always been, you know, in the middle of big power competitions. The birth of nation states in Southeast Asia uh, were during the Cold War. And throughout, you know, the, uh, we only enjoyed uh, peace in the immediate post-Cold War period. But now, you know, competition is back again. So this is nothing new. So for Southeast Asian countries and for Indonesia in particular, uh, which has a doctrine of free and active foreign policy, uh, a strategy of non-alignment is part of its DNA foreign policy, and ASEAN as the cornerstone of foreign policy, which always seeks strategic autonomy, uh, trying to engage with all major powers, but not becoming too dependent on any one of them. So this is nothing new uh, for, for Indonesia or for Southeast Asia. What we have always tried to do is to prevent Southeast Asia from becoming a theater of conflict. So that's why you know, we have to uh, strengthen ASEAN cohesion on the one hand, and then also enhance ASEAN's agency as a regional convener, as you might say, a middle power organization, uh, which tries to bring uh, the different sides uh, together to uh, promote uh, 
dynamic equilibrium where all uh, major powers uh, are also uh, included in various uh, discussions and issues. So this is this is actually you know the objective of ASEAN and also Indonesia's foreign policy. Uh, at the same time, um, Indonesia uh, as a middle power is also very active in engaging in various minilateralism, bilateralism and minilateralism, uh, working together with India, with Australia, uh, with MICTA countries, you know, there's also with, uh, with Korea here. Uh, can middle power uh, tries to defuse conflicts? You know, that, that is the primary role of middle powers. The middle powers come to their own during uh, conflicts. Otherwise, uh, there's not really much space for, for middle powers. You know, middle power tries to, uh, to act as a bridge uh, to facilitate uh, uh, discussions, uh, to try to mediate. Uh, so, so I do believe that, you know, this is actually what we call the middle power moment. And there is, people talk Can about I emerging, mm -hmm. uh, cold, yeah, sorry, people talk about emerging Cold War. I particularly, you know, uh, I do not believe that this is uh, a return, you know, to, oh, this is a Cold War 2.0. Because this is not all ideological, this is not a total zero-sum game, because most of those competitions between the US and China actually are sectoral in nature. There's, there's a trade war, there's an on, uh, technology issue, there's a uh, fashion issue, you know, uh, there, there, there are many, many, many issues, but they tend to be much more functional. So there is actually possibility of reaching agreements in those various uh, sectors. And, and, and as we mentioned before, there are a lot of transnational is issues which make it possible uh, for countries to work on certain issues uh, together. And whether, you know, the Ambassador question whether- John? Uh, yeah. Uh, apologies there, Ibu Dewi. Ambassador Chan, is this not a Cold yeah, yeah. War? Uh, well, Henry Kissinger said, we are at the foothills of the Cold War. I think it looks like the Cold War, but uh, it walks like a Cold War, but I think the men, all the the community of nations don't want it to be a cold war. No one wants a cold war, and I think uh, because of that, countries are playing their roles to try to enlarge the middle space. This is where the middle powers step in. Uh, I agree with Shishanka. I agree with Davy. This is the middle power moment, and you can see it. For instance, this whole idea of the Indo-Pacific strategy. You have, you know, uh, Japan, Australia, India, the United States working together, a bit like the Quad. And uh, ASEAN does not want to sign up for the Indo-Pacific as spelt out as a free and open Indo-Pacific. Indonesia came up with the idea and ASEAN has proposed an Indo-Pacific strategy that emphasizes ASEAN centrality and inclusiveness. We do not exclude anyone. So here you have, we are a middle player, middle power player, and uh, we would like to create more space, create more strategic space. And frankly, through this uh, whole period, 2017 and 2018, we have seen the middle powers come into its own. Japan has been extremely active as a middle power. TPP ended when the United States walked out, but Japan picked it up. And now we have CPTPP. Japan, you know, acted and tried to uh, form strategic partnerships with a lot of countries in the region, maritime cooperation, defense cooperation, and so on. And they came up with the Indo-Pacific strategy. So they are trying to work their space. But I think you are seeing a lot of the middle countries and small countries, particularly at this moment during the time of COVID, trying to stay away from the big power competition, US and China, everything is so politicized. They are forming, in fact, minilaterals. They are cooperating. For instance, Singapore with six countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, Chile, Myanmar, and Brunei, wanted to ensure trade lines and see links open for flow of goods and to maintain the global links. And absent the US leadership, Canada convened a multi, a ministerial group of 12 other countries, 13 countries all together. And this is uh, Brazil, France, Germany, Indonesia, Italy, Morocco, Mexico, Peru, ROK, Singapore, Turkey, United Kingdom. And they want to pool research and scientific resources and share 
findings. No US, no China. They do not want to politicize uh, science. So I think you are seeing middle powers coming together, forming different kinds of coalition to avoid a binary choice of US and China. Uh, June, the overriding theme we've had so far is that there's greater cooperation among the middle powers. Does it complement or undermine global multilateral institutions? As it stands now, the authority of these multilateral institutions, organizations are already uh, being challenged. Well, given the COVID-19 um, pandemic, I think uh, international institutions have come to a standstill. They've hit a wall with regard to where they can go ahead in terms of multilateral cooperation, because first things first, the U.S. and China are at odds about uh, where the virus actually originated from. And the Australian in initiative to take this to the WHO has been met with backfiring. And uh, other issues regarding trade at the World Trade Organization, I think that uh, because from the Obama administration, there haven't been a proactive hiring uh, uh, appointment of uh, judges on the appellate body, and that has continued on, uh, although there was no significant um, gesture from the Trump administration to actually depart from it. Ambassador Lighthizer of the USTR is not really keen on WTO reform itself, uh, perhaps uh, maybe just undermining the, the institution uh, entirely. So I think going forward, what would be really challenging is to bring about efforts at the international institutions that are already in place. And even if there are efforts, there may be different groupings, such as the one that we have at this moment right now, just middle power groups or uh, other standalone groupings uh, based on issues that are really emerging or really, really immediate. So that's a critical concern and international institutions may not have the power that they used to have before. Ambassador John, what's your take on it? Uh, on the multilateral institutions? That's right, yes. Um, right now, the uh, United States is walking away from the multilateral institutions, but I don't think that represents a spectrum of U.S. opinions. Uh, China feels that the multilateral institutions really did not reflect uh, their views and they were not there at the uh, origins and the beginnings. But they haven't pulled out of multilateral institutions, they tried to reform it. And I think middle powers should go back. We need to redo the WTO. We need to strengthen WHO. And if we work with these institutions, it can really help the world come to a better place and rules. And frankly, I think there needs to be some thought given to the new digital economy and cyberspace and so on. And you really need multilateral institutions to come up with those kinds of rules. Uh, Shiv, I want to take a look at India's relations with China. You are India's ambassador to China, and you say that China's behavior has been very different from anything we've seen in the past. With China now becoming an Indian Ocean maritime power, as you suggest as well, how should India respond to this? Well, I think uh, India-China relations today are in crisis because of what happened over the spring on, on the border. That could work either way. Uh, it could represent an opportunity to create a new strategic framework for the relationship by the two sides, or it could go the other way. Uh, more likely, I think we'll choose the third option, which is sort of muddling through. Uh, winter setting in, which makes clashes unlikely but uh, for the time being. But we're now in this frozen sort of confrontation on the border. And so that, I think, has prompted a lot of people in India to look for other alternatives uh, to the traditional Indian strategy, which is a balancing strategy, which is non-alignment, which is strategic autonomy, 
but which is also not being too close to any of the great powers, or at least not not ceding the power of decision in these relationships, and therefore trying, say, between China and the U.S. to have good relations with both. I think that is no longer an option. So naturally, people look at other balancing strategies. They look to the U.S. They look to other powers in the region, this uh, to other countries, Japan, Singapore, Korea, Indonesia, friends in the region to work together and to see whether we can't actually create an inclusive, open, plural Asia Pacific uh, for or Indo Pacific for all of us to actually prosper in. Now, the trouble is that we have an India-China crisis at the same time as well. The world has this trifecta of an economic crash, pandemic, etc., and no leadership. So no multilateral organizations actually working uh, or effectively. So, so in that situation, it seems to me it's an opportunity for us to recast the way we do our business, to actually concentrate on the things that are important. Uh, and the only people who can really do this are the middle parts. The trouble is, of course, that all the institutions we use, multilateral institutions, are only as good as the member states are. As If the member states are divided, if they're disunited, and if the great powers especially are disunited, then the institutions themselves are ineffective. So I think we need to look for new ways of doing business. And India will turn more Yes, certainly to the U.S., because they have a shared understanding, I think, of how China is going about her business. Uh, but I think beyond that, India will also look for other arrangements, for other balancing arrangements with other countries. Now, India has basic choices to make, and let's see which ones she does. Because like China, India, too, as a result of the pandemic and the economic crash, it's talking of self-sufficiency. Uh, but how much autarky does that really involve? And I don't see how an Indian economy where almost half the GDP is the external sector can ever go back to import substitution and so on. So, but India has to choose then to actually participate in, uh, in reworking the global trading and economic system. And, and that's going to be, that's going to pose some difficult choices. Uh, we really are at a crossroads. I know it's a cliche, but but we really are today. And let's see, let's see where India goes on this. And very quickly, though, Shiv, before I speak to Ibu uh, Dewi, what happened to the close relationship between Xi Jinping and Modi? Well, you know, I th I think it's dangerous to personalize relations between big countries because the more you personalize, the more you lose strategy. Uh, and I think there's no question, even today, at the leadership level, there have been consistent efforts to try and work through the crisis, to try and uh, at least make sure that it doesn't get worse, and to try and dial it down, to keep the temperature low. If you look at statements at the leadership level, they've been very restrained on both sides. Uh, that continues, but the problems are more structural, I think, especially on issues like the border or the trade uh, imbalances which exist. You know, I mean, almost uh, half of India's trade imbalance, trade deficit is because of trade with China. Uh, and the, the other frictions that have arisen in the recent past. But uh, for me, those are issues which, if we do work out a new strategic framework, after all, we did manage to work one out before and keep the peace and develop the relationship over the last three, four decades, uh, despite having a boundary dispute. And I don't see why we can't do that again, but it's going to take some adjustment by both sides. Right. Ibu Dewi, Indonesia, the biggest country in Southeast Asia, 250 million uh, people. How are these geopolitical concerns shaping Indonesia's own defense and foreign policy? How does it view its strategic outlook? Well, Indonesia's strategic outlook has been more or less quite constant, uh, you know, uh, trying to ensure that the Southeast Asian region in particular uh, remains autonomous, that, you know, it is not 
uh, dominated by uh, external powers and that close cooperation uh, between all of the uh, countries. And also now increasingly uh, with ASEAN becoming more confident, uh, engaging all of those countries. So there had been a change in that sense when I say there's constant strategic economy. In the old days, uh, there was this desire to keep all countries out, all major powers out, you know, kind of leave us alone kind of attitude and leave us alone to do our uh, internal development. But now there's also a more outward looking strategy of trying to engage all countries. You know, that's why, you know, the creation of various ASEAN regional mechanisms which engage uh, external powers. Uh, in terms of its uh, defense policy, uh, it's not really driven by security dilemma, it's more driven by, by budget constraints. So uh, at the moment, Indonesia has tried to improve its uh, military capability, uh, de develop minimal uh, essential force, uh, you know, that's been uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the past uh, 15 years. Uh, but uh, as I said, you know, it's not driven by, by uh, uh, mm. concerns of traditional threats so much. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of concerns more about non-traditional uh, security threats. So uh, in, in terms of engaging all sides, at the moment, Indonesia has very close relations with China, probably the best relations ever uh, because of Professor Jokowi's uh, focus on infrastructure development. So Indonesia is the participant of the BRI. It is a member of the uh, uh, Asian uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, you know, it's, it's very open uh, to Chinese investment. But at the same time, uh, uh, there are also problems uh, on the South China Sea issue. Indonesia is not uh, a party to the, you know, to the conflict in the South China Sea, but we have problems uh, with China's non, uh, nine dash land, which Indonesia, of course, does not recognize because this is not uh, recognized in the uh, uh, 1982 law of the sea. So in fact, Indonesia has renamed uh, its, its sea uh, that would, uh, you know, the exclusive economic zones uh, around the Natuna as North Natuna uh, Sea to, to enforce uh, its national claim. Uh, and it, domestically, uh, cons suspicions of China remain very high. So that is, there are this uh, very uh, complicated issue with, with China uh, for Indonesia. It is not just a foreign policy issue. It is also very much complicated with domestic issues. And we always have to be very, uh, uh, very careful, mm -hmm. very, that, that anti-China sentiment does not also become anti-Chinese sentiment in Indonesia. That, that also, uh, you know, something that Indonesia always has to be very careful about. At the same time, um, in terms of uh, ensuring this strategic autonomy, uh, not becoming too dependent on, on other countries, while trying to engage with China, trying to bring in China's money uh, uh, to, to uh, support Indonesia's infrastructure development, uh, it also actively tries to engage with Japan. You know, in a couple of days, uh, the new Prime Minister of Japan is making his first state visit to ASEAN countries, and that is to, to Indonesia. Uh, and, uh, and, and also, you know, despite the difficulties that Trump is not a favorite uh, character in Indonesia, particularly because Indonesia is the world's largest Muslim nation, and that uh, also a very uh, strong support of the Palestinian uh, independence. So uh, there is a lot of opposition to the current uh, uh, leadership in the U.S., but at the same time, uh, the U relations with the U.S. also remains uh, close, you know, in terms of uh, security cooperation, also including in the fact that. So uh, for, for Indonesia, this is, as I said, you know, this is our default drive. Uh, Indonesia thrives in the, the, in the kind of this global power competition. Uh, uh, actually, it sees opportunities when there are, it, it, it is much more concerning when major powers are too much in concert and squeeze the middle powers out. So when there are a bit of rivalry, you know, it is actually an opportunity. Uh, for 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 Indonesia and other uh, ASEAN countries and other middle powers, you know, to uh, to find space and also to uh, actually get more uh, deals, better deals uh, with with China, muzzling in Indonesia uh, that actually creates greater interest from Japan, for example, to improve uh, its terms of uh, loan and, and and so on. So in 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 this case, I said, you know, uh, Indonesia has continued to emphasize uh, its uh, independent uh, foreign policy. Uh, speaking of Japan, June, US-China tensions coming at a time of changing power relationships between Korea and Japan, both see their economic 
and national interests somewhat converge. Could this be the right time, an opportune time for deeper cooperation between the two, or is the is the uh, mistrust and the issue of uh, history still too great for the two? Um, on this issue, uh, I am very much realistic about the future paths because uh, a couple of days ago, uh, the new Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga decided, uh, indicated that he would not attend the trilateral summit uh, as long as there is no mechanism set in place in South Korea with regard to putting a stall systematically to the caching of uh, wartime uh, labor, forced labor related uh, assets uh, to be seized based on the Supreme Court's ruling in, in South Korea a few years ago. And there's been, you know, the, the, the ruling had uh, unleashed a trade conflict between the two countries on semiconductor parts, uh, ingredients to semiconductors. And the conflict, uh, one year on, this, this trade mechanism on tech, high tech, it's uh, expanded into areas that we have not really fathomed, uh, especially pertaining to Huawei and other, because uh, the semiconductor industry is essentially what's going to drive the next generation of future industries, not just on uh, network infrastructure, but also uh, artificial intelligence. So I think this, the history issue is what it looks like on the outside, and it's very, very deep. At the same time, the tech war is probably what is the most immediate concern between the two countries. And this kind of friction, the bilateral friction between Japan and South Korea does not help Washington at all. Uh, with regard to uh, Washington's efforts to group the countries together into uh, more of a collaborative scheme, be it on military terms or on economic terms. So it's going to be very difficult for them to advance middle power cooperation, you think? Exactly, because the history issue uh, from the Japanese side um, on the assets freezing of wartime companies, uh, uh, Japanese companies, uh, the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, the LDP, the, the ruling party, uh, there's, a, there's a very, very stark bottom line on this, which is that they are not going to negotiate on this issue. And, you know, it's not just within the region that you witness this. In Germany, in Berlin, uh, there has been an ongoing uh, debate, dispute, about uh, you know Japan, the Japanese government's demands to remove the statue, the Comfort Woman statue, uh, and the the Berlin city has had to um, sort of succumb to Japanese demands. And then with the public opinion backlash, they they would they would just indicate that they would work out a solution by not immediately removing it. And it remains to be seen what what kinds of responses throughout the world there may be on Japan's history issues. This is just the beginning. And uh, as long as the leadership here does not change, there's a presidential election in 2022. But uh, on the Japan side, you know, prime ministers go come and go. Uh, it's not for sure how long these leaders will be in place and how the leaderships would change. These are democracies. But as long as the two lines are going in parallel, this is going to be very difficult. Ambassador Chan, we heard from Shiv earlier about how China's behavior is unlike the past. The thing is, U.S. behavior is also unlike the past. Uh, how does a small nation like Singapore balance its relations with the U.S., which is a strategic ally, and China, which is a top trading partner? When you take a look at what Singapore hopes out of the US and China, how does that look like? How do we balance a relationship? People ask me that all the time. And I say <laughs> with difficulty, you know, it's not that easy. But I think Singapore has always behaved in a consistent way. We are open and we are frank. If we can do something, we'll say yes. If we can't do something, we'll say no whether it is to the United States or to China. And we have sometimes, by our actions, offended the United States. We have also offended China. And I think over time, other countries look at Singapore and realize we are acting in our own interests. We have 
many equities, strong equities with the United States. Similarly, as you say, with China, you know. So I think that's the way we move our relationship. And uh, we hope this is a path we can keep, although it is getting increasingly difficult. But let me put it this way, um, Haslinda. Everybody says, uh, who do you choose? How do you choose? My own thinking about choice is that all countries do not want a binary choice. But nobody actually says, I choose the US or I choose China. End of story. The choice is final. Actually, choice is really a number uh, taking a series of small choices. For instance, if the United States puts an initiative on the table, TPP, some countries sign up for it, some countries don't. Then they put the free and open Indo-Pacific on the table, some countries sign up for it, none of the ASEAN countries did. The Chinese put BRI on the table, countries sign for it, some countries don't. Japan and Australia, you know, it's not very supportive, nor of AIIB. So you have BRI, AIIB, BCEP. So countries sign up for individual initiatives. They do not just meet at a grand meeting and say, I'm on this side or that side. So I think over time, the choices add up. And, but most countries would like to be able to choose from both sides. You know, so that is how Singapore also sees its path forward. That is not really just binary choice. And we are actively engaging other countries. We talk all the time about small states having agency. We believe in that. We are quite active with minilaterals. And I think you create new groupings, overlapping groupings. And that, I think, strengthens the fabric and it doesn't sort of <coughs> tear things apart. Uh, you talk about how ASEAN countries are working together. Do you see COVID-19 as an opportunity to, to bring ASEAN closer together? Has it brought the region closer together? Uh, well, the hope is that we will. Uh, I think during the COVID period, uh, ASEAN countries have tried, those who can, to help each other, sending you know test kits, uh, vaccines, equipment, ventilators, and so on. And I know Singapore does uh, quite a bit sending to Myanmar, and we have received from others too. So uh, I think we send some to Indonesia, but we are just helping each other. But everyone is so caught up with their own internal problems. But what is important is that ASEAN countries are trying to open up to each other. We understand that for the region, for our countries, for the region to recover, we have to open up. So Malaysia and Singapore is looking at opening up. Indonesia and Singapore is look looking at opening up. And Singapore is in talks with Thailand to open up also. Of course, Singapore is very active in this, and we have to be. We are a small country, a micro state, a tiny state, and we have no resources, no hinterland. We survive on connectivity. So we have to keep the connections open. So we are active and other countries are open to it. So if ASEAN countries start opening to each other, Vietnam as well, I think we will bring ASEAN together, closer together. And these travel bubbles will start forming groupings. By the way, there are other travel bubbles opening up also. But in the Asian region, East Asian region, these um, Bubbles may become some kind of grouping and, you know, you have uh, permutations there. And if you deal with each other, there are lots of visits and exchanges. Well, you have a new space to work with. Uh, Shiv, we know that India is engaging with Southeast Asia. Does rising Hindu nationalism under the BJP government impact its potential ties with the region, uh, how, how do you view that, especially when it's dealing with Muslim-majority countries like Malaysia, like Indonesia? Well, I'm not sure that today it's a major fact. Today there are other bigger issues in these relationships.
than concerns about the internal course that one or the other might be following. Uh, I think there's much bigger issues in dealing with the pandemic for one is uh, getting an economic recovery going, getting the economic relationship up and running, creating what uh, Hung Chi was just talking about, creating safe spaces, bubbles within which people can start traveling, we can restore connectivity. I think those things take priority. So I'm not sure that worry about the internal direction that any other country is taking right now is going to take priority or should actually because there are much more basic issues of survival at stake here of survival of jobs of of livelihoods uh, so i'm not sure that that actually is a big factor but for india i think connectivity with southeast asia has become critical you know when when India started reform, only about 15% of GDP was the external sector. By 2014, it was 49.6%. That's almost half of GDP. You add remittances and so on. And the rest of the world has become much more important. And in the rest of the world, Southeast Asia has, has actually grown much, much more important to India. So for me, that's the driver of the relationship. Uh, when you talk of an Indo-Pacific strategy, you can't have an Indo-Pacific strategy with a big hole in the middle without ASEAN involved, without Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, other countries in, in Southeast Asia involved in producing the public goods that today, unfortunately, the world order is no longer producing, whether it's, you know, safety of the sea lanes. We've worked together against piracy and worked very successfully in the past. There's a whole host of things that we can be doing and should be doing. And right now, I think the priority has to be the economy and and getting past the pandemic together, uh, which, again, as I said, is not something we can do alone, any of us. In terms of India's influence in Southeast Asia, India's left our step. Does it make India less influential among Southeast Asian countries? You know, I think th these relationships are based on mutual interest rather than on influence or, or uh, so for me, as long as there's this huge congruence of interest, this coincidence of interest, that's what's going to drive the relationship forward more than what you might think about somebody's beliefs or behavior. Uh, June, I want to talk about Korea's engagement with Southeast Asia in its southern policy, which was established about three years ago, three years on, how much has been achieved? Have ASEAN nations responded the way Korea had envisioned? It's still an ongoing process. And I think the cultural aspect of uh, K-culture influence into the region has been more salient than in other areas. Uh, as a political economist, I would like to point out that the competition that South Korea faces in Southeast Asia is pretty much severe because uh, other countries like Japan and uh, China have had first mover advantage, Japan especially, uh, for the longest time. And breaking ground in Southeast Asia requires that kind of maneuvering within the region. And also Australia, you know, the presence of other countries that are already there make it a tougher competition. But culturally, I think it's been very, very successful. And uh, especially with the dissemination and impact of K-culture in there, it's been widely received. Um, I think that in terms of military cooperation, uh, you know, South Korea has not been uh, very much responsive to the U.S. request to join the Quad, and I don't think it actually will under this administration. And if there is a, an initiative to sort of uh, formulate something akin to the NATO in the European region, uh, chances are uh, the kind of lack of connectivity may sort of hinder South Korea's overall participation in such kind of grouping. But one-to-one -one in terms of South Korea, ASEAN related cooperation, I think it's going pretty well. And there's been a lot of uh, scholastic slash policy exchanges over the past three years under this administration. That's That's been a remarkable progress. 
Eva Dewi, what's your take on Korea's southern policy? Has it been a two-way engagement? Has there been reciprocity? And how do you build on it? Well, uh, I think we look at it at the regional level and at the uh, bilateral level. Uh, if you look at the bilateral level, as June said, you know, uh, South Korea actually has uh, had a very uh, in-depth and extensive relations in Indonesia. If you look at the, uh, until recently, until a lot of Chinese workers come to Indonesia, the largest uh, expat workers in Indonesia are, are Koreans. A lot of the manufacturing industries in Indonesia are Korean-owned. Uh, and uh, Indonesians also work in Korean companies uh, under the so-called uh, trainee program. So at the bilateral level, uh, it's a, a quite extensive relation. And in fact, in terms of uh, uh, military cooperation, Indonesia and Korea are working together to build uh, 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 fighter planes and also uh, to build uh, 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 warships. Uh, I think at the regional level, ASEAN-Korean ASEAN, uh, relations have also uh, developed uh, in, you know, from sectoral relations to full dialogue partnership. Uh, what we have uh, tried to do, you know, uh, in terms of the uh, Korean Peninsula issue, uh, ASEAN has been the primary regional convener and there is ASEAN Regional Forum and there is this East Asia uh, uh, Forum and so on and so forth. Uh, but in terms of the discussions on the Korean Peninsula, ASEAN has been excluded. That's also been uh, my, my uh, complaints for a long time. You know, why, why not also include uh, ASEAN in, in the uh, discussions? Uh, so uh, I would argue that ASEAN uh, uh, and Korea uh, have uh, uh, worked together and it, uh, it has responded to, to the, the, the Korean Southern policy. And at the bilateral level, I think uh, Korea is also very, uh, very well received. And in, also in terms of middle power, Indonesia, Korea, and Australia are part of MICTA. You know, that's a, this middle powers grouping within the G20 uh, that comprise of Mexico, Indonesia, Korea, uh, Turkey, and, and Australia. And that's, uh, as, although it's not working very well at the moment because the focus is also on, on uh, democratic cooperation. And, and there's been some democratic uh, regression in a number of countries. So, so MICTA has not been as successful in that in that aspect but korea and indonesia uh, continue to drive uh, this so southern the southern policies i think you know, it has to be looked at at the, uh, the bilateral level also at the regional level but also at the uh, multilateral level uh, minilateralism and i would argue that uh, korean pop culture is is very popular in indonesia uh, also uh, Shiv, we heard June talk about uh, the court. We're hot on the heels of the court meeting involving India, Australia, Japan, the US. Have relations among the court members changed fundamentally over the last uh, eight months or so, given that India, Australia, the US do have issues with China? Uh, yes, but they also have uh, big stakes in their relationships with China. I mean, China is still for India, the biggest trading partner in goods. And despite the crisis, if you look at April to September this year, India-China trade figures are up. They've actually risen. Uh, so, And China is India's biggest neighbor on land. And there's no question, as you said, China is a presence in the Indian Ocean, just as the Indian Navy now operates beyond Malacca as well. So. Actually, India and China rub up against each other in so many ways that, you know, it's as uh, I think Hang Chi was saying, we need to look at this as a process at politics in the region. It's not a question of choosing one side or the other or of deep coupling from each other. I don't think that's quite how it's going to work. Uh, where does the Quad figure in this? The Quad is useful because each of us has very strong bilateral relationships to the extent that we can actually work together as we are now doing about to do in in say naval exercises uh, to that extent it's a useful addition but ultimately it's only a forum which is as good as its members want to make it we've we tried the quad earlier in 2007 and it then withered away in 2008.
precisely because, as you said, some members were more worried about their relationship with China at that stage. Today, we're in a slightly different situation. And I think the Quad is really an organization in search of a role. And if it is to have a real future, it will have to find function, functional cooperation avenues where other people also work with it. Just the four alone are not going to be able to do it. It's a dialogue forum. Yes, it's useful to exchange opinions, information, uh, but that's only a dialogue forum. So far, that's what it is, a quadrilateral security dialogue. Taking it beyond that will require the participation, working with others, and an expansion at least, and an identification of very clear functional areas where it has potential. So I, I, you know, I'm rather surprised actually by the vehemence of the Chinese reaction against something that is still quite amorphous and could evolve in various ways. Uh, with India already cooperating with Australia with the Quad arrangement, uh, is it conceivable that India would invite Australia to join the Malabar naval exercise with the U.S. and Japan? Well, it looks almost certain now. It, it seems that I think it's it's probably going to happen in, in the next next round. Do you think India wants to step up its strategic interest in the Indo-Pacific? Is there reason to, to think India would be heading that way? Uh, India is in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, it's just the name itself tells you that India is there. Whether, so, and Indian interests in maritime security, which is basically what the Indo-Pacific is about. It's a maritime concept, uh, have been growing steadily over the years and will continue to grow. This is where the future is. But then India is also a continental part. And neither the Quad nor the idea of the Indo-Pacific actually address those issues, as we saw this spring on the border with China. So India is the only one, actually, of the Quad members which is both a maritime and a continental power, and which therefore has to deal not just with China, but with the change situation across the board in multiple dimensions. Uh, so India, in that sense, in the Quad, does have interests beyond the Indo-Pacific and beyond. For India, we like to look at our interests, our security at least, in terms of concentric circles. It's not just the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean region, but what happens in West Asia, what happens in Southeast Asia, what happens in Northeast Asia, all of them in Central Asia, they all affect us almost directly. So given our location, uh, I think looking just at the Indo-Pacific from an Indian point of view doesn't, doesn't actually solve our dilemmas, our problems. Uh I'd like to pose this question to all the speakers. Of course, we are counting down to the U.S. election with 20 days or so left. Will the Biden presidency dial down tensions with China, even though he himself has said that China is the biggest security threat for the world? Perhaps we can start with uh, Ambassador Chan. Well, you know, the uh, U.S. relationship with China, you know, in fact, there is now a bipartisan uh, consensus on how the United States should deal with China. And you know, the American polity believes that they should be tougher with China, they should be firmer with China, and they should try to work out the tra trade deficits and you know, some of the issues in the technology sector, etc. Uh, I think the difference between a Biden administration, if Joe Biden is elected, and that of the present Trump administration, would be really a change in tenor. There would be, I think, more predictability in the uh, approach to China, and there would be a framework. Right now, I think in the Trump administration, the way policies are formed, it uh, sometimes uh, it just comes as a bit of a surprise, the tone is a bit of a surprise, and so there would be greater predictability. And countries like predictability, and I guess uh, the Asian region would like to see some predictability, and that helps. But I think in the general 
trend towards dealing with China, uh, whether it's a Biden presidency or a Trump second presidency, it, the United States will be tough with China. Uh, I think Biden's uh, team, if they should come in, would like to confront China, but also work with China. They want to work with China on issues of non-proliferation, the pandemic, uh, climate change particularly, and for the Democrats, climate change is a big issue. So there are areas of cooperation and areas where they would stand up and really deal with China and confront China there. Now, this is not so very different. Actually, under President Obama, and I do remember because I was still in the United States, when I spoke to the officials in the White House and in the State Department, they always said when they went to ARF meetings, EAS meetings, they would be tough with China on some issues, particularly the South China Sea. But they always were concerned to roll out a roster of you know, uh, items, that agenda items that they would work with China on. So, you know, there was cooperation, but there was also, you know, an attempt to check and uh, confront China on issues that they wanted to solve. And so this was how the Democrats uh, approached the Chinese the relationship with China. I think in the case of President Trump, you see more of what he has done in the uh, first term, and I think countries in the region are uh, concerned. Although there is another school that feels that because President Trump is transactional and he wants to uh, seal a deal, that there could be surprises. And you could see surprises in the second term. They would still be tough, but who knows? You know, never count anything out. Everything is possible in politics. Ambassador Chan, thank you for that. Uh, we we are running out of time very quickly. I just want to pose this uh, polling question to you uh, for our speakers. How do you think the COVID-19 crisis will reshape the global order? One, revival of the nation state with every country for itself. Two, greater global cooperation with stronger multilateral institutions. Three, stronger regional groupings built around middle powers and for nothing will change. Perhaps I can call on uh, Shiv. What's your take on it? Uh, my, I think it actually accelerates existing trends and therefore I think it's more, number one, uh, the strengthening of the nation state and the fragmentation of the international, of the global order, whether it's economic or political, uh, rather than strength than the other three options. June? I agree. Ibadewi? Well, then I think I'll be, very, I, I'll be different. I think that to, uh, it will be changes, but it will be nothing actually really, really going to, to change very much because uh, nationalism, you know, for in new countries, uh, nation states has always been very strong, but we also want to work with multilateral systems and we also want to strengthen the cooperation. So, uh, cool. Prof. Chan, you have the last word. Well, you know, I belong to the school that believes that there will not be a great transformation post-COVID because we should not underestimate, uh, you know, that people, uh, human beings, really revert to the status quo. There's a great resistance to change. So in individual societies, I do not see that much change. But in the global order, internationally, I would say the first three, uh, I, uh, you know, uh, positions that was listed in the survey, all of that, all the three will happen. Uh, countries will turn inward, they will be nationalistic, and, you know, Modi has said that, you know, I think Pri uh, Prime Minister Modi in May also said that, uh, uh, India will now, you know, look more inward in some form of words. Japan has emphasized self-autonomy. Every country will want some self-sufficiency. But I think it is also true that new regional groupings will 
come about, middle powers will try to come together. We've been talking about the minilaterals and the new regional grouping. So I think you will see a lot of movement and action in the uh, international uh, uh, arena. Also, there will be attempts, great concern to strengthen WHO, because I think everybody now sees health as an important, uh, a very important element in the life of nations and in our personal lives. And also, um, I think the WTO needs fixing, and I'm hoping that G20 would somehow take it up and start thinking through what does a new uh, WTO look like. And on that note, I'd like to wrap up our discussion today. Thank you to Dr. Jun Park, Ambassador Chan Heng Chi, Dr. David Fortuna Anwa, and Shivshankar Madden. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Have a good day ahead.